Imagine a cold winter's night in 1974. The air heavy with anticipation as TWA Flight 514 descends towards Dulles International Airport. What transpired in those final moments before impact? The answer lingers in the shadows, hinting at a tale that goes beyond twisted metal and shattered dreams. But our exploration doesn't conclude with a tragedy alone. Venture with us into the realm of where the crash site is said to be a harbor of more than memories, whispers of the spectral apparitions that defy explanation, and the ambiance steeped in the sorrow of lives cut short. Could a place truly retain the echoes of a haunting history? Today we're peeling back layers of TWA Flight 514, a routine journey that spiraled into calamity. Brace yourselves as we navigate through the details, offering a glimpse into the unsettling moments leading up to the crash. So let's secure our metaphorical seatbelts as we embark onto a voyage into one of the mysteries of aviation and the shadowy terrain, the boundaries between reality and otherworldly blur. Those brave enough to confront the spectral truth that awaits. Welcome to Destination Aviation. We are well into spooky season here on Destination Aviation Podcast. Welcome back, everyone. We are fresh off of our trip to the National Business Aviation Association in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Went to the Spear, went and saw you 2 Had uh, a lot of opportunity to talk with a lot of different people. Actually, I had 32 meetings lined up while I was out there, so... It was a busy, busy week on top of getting the podcast squared away and everything that we talked about Janet-wise. So a very long week in Las Vegas, but a fun week, enjoyable week. I was able to give out some podcast stickers. Uh, Thank you for everybody that participated. Thank you to everybody that came up and uh, wanted to have a conversation. So as we do up here at the front of the podcast, talk a little bit about some aviation news uh, episode, two episodes, I think, ago. We talked a little bit about McSpadden, whose Cardinal crashed up in Lake Placid, New York. Uh, The NTSB says now that the Cessna 177 RG carrying Richard McSpadden crashed about 440 feet short of Lake Placid's runway 14 in a failed attempt to return to the airport after McSpadden reported an unspecified problem with the plane. According to the preliminary report, McSpadden was in the right seat and Russ Francis, the owner of the plane and former NFL player and Super Bowl winner, was in the left seat. And it was unclear who was flying when the aircraft hit the embankment about 15 feet below the brow of the plateau on which the airport is built. Examination of the wreckage didn't appear to reveal any issues with the plane, which had plenty of fuel and almost a brand new engine. Weather was clear and winds were light. Francis had recently purchased Lake Placid Airways, which ultimately owned the aircraft. McSpadden, a former commander of the Air Force Thunderbirds, was a highly respected accident analyst. He frequently published factual descriptions of high-profile accidents soon after they occurred with the intent of tempering some of the speculative analysis from social media influencers. It is interesting, um, as we all know, turning back to the airport if there is an issue or an engine out issue always is not advisable below a thousand feet. Uh, I have seen people killed that way personally, um, but obviously it sounds to hear like there's no immediate evidence of what happened in that crash. So I'm sure that they will continue to hopefully unravel the mystery uh, that is this plane accident. So I did come back on United Airlines. Boy, what a mess. Harry Reid International Airport. I uh, ranted it a little bit in the previous podcast about the soap in the sink <laughs> phenomenon, but the same thing happened when I got in there again. There's like no soap in any of the sinks. So, you know, the website said United Airlines opened at uh, 3.15, the ticket counters. I was there uh, right about 3.15, of course. The ticket counters didn't open till 4.15. The sky caps came in uh, at 4, and so there was this whole thing. They ended up charging me twice for my bag. But United didn't switch my seat without telling me. I, I Depends on the flight, but I now later in life... I prefer an aisle seat. That way I can control my own destiny to the lavatory rather than trying to go over to people. They gave me a window seat on the way out. And then on the way back, I was able to get my aisle seat. So I'll take that as a win. But uh, I did get charged twice for my carry or my, yes, my check on luggage. So I'm going to have to try to get in touch with United, which as anybody knows these days is so much fun uh, to try to get anybody on the phone over there. 
in the Washington, D.C. update corner. Maybe we shouldn't even do that. That's just been a huge debacle over there. Uh, I don't even know where we're at right now. Jim Jordan's out. I think they have eight other people. Uh, we're still marching towards November and a potential shutdown again. Um, so it is interesting. Uh, anybody that's out there that's seen the airline JSX, JSX flies uh, part 380, which is a scheduled charter service. Uh, they've flown that for a while. Now, it's actually been no accidents under part 380, but... Uh, the Airline Pilots Association, um, I think American, Southwest Airlines, SkyWest filed to fly under this part, and now the other airlines are saying it's unfair. Basically, there's a lot less restrictions on this type of flying. You know, you don't have to follow the 1,500-hour rule that the 121 scheduled airline carriers have to follow. The security is a lot uh, less intrusive than TSA. Uh, they basically have these R2-D2 looking trash cans that scan you. Both Southwest Airlines American, the Airline Pilots Association, you know, they're all uh, trying to kill it because SkyWest Airlines has filed to fly under this part, so now they think it's unfair, uh, which in return would kill other operations that have been using it for years like JSX. There is um, a lot of opposition. There's a lot of proponents of it. It'll be curious to see. The DOT has out basically uh, open comment on it right now for people that want to submit. A lot of the associations, like for airports, aren't taking sides because airports aren't coalescing around an ideology of what they would like to see. Uh, so a lot of changes potentially coming down the road with chartering flights on-demand charter, scheduled charters. Uh, so we'll be curious to see how that unfolds. I add that in here because it's always interesting to, I think, just kind of know what's going on in our industry, potential changes that are coming down the road with general aviation in particular. So maybe on some more positive news front, we had highlighted in some episodes about the Reno Air Races commencing this year. Because of that, six communities in six different states have submitted supporting documents seeking approval to be the next home of the National Championship of Air Races. The submissions came in as a response for a request for proposal from the Reno Air Racing Association, which hosted the last race at Reno Stead Airport in Nevada last month. Reno has been the home of the races since 1964, so just shy of 60-year run. So what communities we're asking ourselves are vying to become the new venue of the iconic air race. So Bucky, Arizona, Casper, Wyoming, Pueblo, Colorado, Roswell, New Mexico, Thermal, California, and Wendover, Utah. So there's going to be a show, I guess, next year that won't be a non-racing air show in Reno in 2024. And then a transition to the new location in 2025. Uh, but they are still in the selection process. Sounds like a good breadth of candidates there. Um, I don't know if California would be a right pick, just considering how California looks towards aviation, but maybe. You know, I was just in Pueblo, Colorado, and there's not a lot there. Obviously, Roswell, uh, we could enter our friends in their extraterrestrial uh, aircraft to go do some racing there. Maybe Janet can make an appearance. Who knows? But good for them. Hopefully, they find themselves a new home out there. Uh, and then maybe down the road we can all attend the air races. I know my hat from the Reno Air Races has gotten pretty old and is in need of uh, in need of a new one. So maybe I'll find myself at this uh, new air race. So uh, we talked a little bit about the news up here up front, a little bit about getting back from our trip in Las Vegas. So I think we should get into our mystery ghostly <laughs> story. Uh, I did just pick myself up a Minion bat outfit. If you know the Minions, Dave, uh, he's one of those blow-up things for Halloween. Currently, I have him in the living room. Uh, I know that sounds weird, right? But uh, he may transition to outside, uh, see how Halloween goes. I feel like I don't have enough time now between Halloween for everybody <laughs> in the neighborhood to get the full effect of my Minion, but... Uh, if I get an opportunity, I maybe I'll just leave them out after Halloween. Everybody loves somebody who's after the holiday, right? So if I just kind of stay ahead of the game here, or I should say behind of the game, come July 4th, you know, I'll still be cleaning up my Santa Clauses. I digress yet again. All right, let's talk a little bit about the story at hand today. So I think everybody probably knows TWA or Trans World Airlines. 
TWA is a major airline in the United States that started operating in 1930 until 2001. I'll be honest, I didn't know they were still operating in 2001. I didn't know when that acquisition from American Airlines had happened. I do know I've been into the St. Louis airport, and they've been able to, I think, turn things around a little bit there. They just had that huge announcement from Boeing, but obviously St. Louis is one of those airports that got wrapped up in the whole acquisition merger components that left the airport uh, without a hub. And so for a long time, there's been all this conversation about St. Louis airport after TWA, after the dehubbing, maybe to look at it for privatizing. Privatization of airports in the United States just doesn't really work. Uh, the FAA likes to see that airports have taxing authority. And so at best, you know, you may see a terminal partner, like public-private partnership of privatization, but a full outright of privatizing a commercial airport. Uh, there's just not a good case study for it in the U.S. Uh, Howard Hughes, of course, acquired uh, control of TWA in 1939 after World War II. Uh, he led an expansion of it to serve Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, making TWA a second unofficial flag carrier of the United States after Pan Am. Hughes gave up control of the airline in the 1960s, and the new management of TWA acquired Hilton International and Century 21 and attempted to diversify the company's business. Didn't know that either uh, until I was reading into this. TWA was headquartered at one time at Kansas City, Missouri, and planned to make Kansas City International Airport its main domestic international hub, but abandoned that plan in the 1970s. The airline later developed its largest hub at St. Louis Airport, its main transatlantic hub was TWA Flight Center at John F. Kennedy International Airport. I have not been to that hotel at John F. Kennedy that's themed in TWA, but I so badly want to go. I know some friends that have gone there and raved about uh, what a great opportunity it is to just kind of immerse yourself in some TWA culture. I know some people that were just out there for an event that was hosted at the hotel uh, and it looked like a lot of enjoyment. For an aviation fan, and if you're not an aviation fan, it's probably still fun in some ways. It's better than the Red Roof Inn, right? Of course, my father, if we were driving on the highway, he would look for the hotel that said, uh, best in or relax in, or maybe just the obligatory hotel. Uh, that was, uh, that was always, uh, you know, it's a classy place when, when you check in, they give you the towels. <laughs> Back to our, our, uh, debrief on TWA in January of 2001, TWA filed for a third and filed bankruptcy and was acquired by American airlines from some of our previous episodes, as we know, all this now traced back to when U.S. Airways bought American Allegheny Airlines. And I just saw new livery. I believe it was on an A321 with American Airlines that had Allegheny Airlines listed as the livery on the aircraft. America laid off many former TWA employees in the wake of September 11, 2001 attacks. TWA continued to exist as an LLC under American Airlines until July 1st of 2003. American Airlines closed the St. Louis hub in 2009. So TWA Flight 514 had a registration tail number of November 54328, all numbers. It was a Boeing 727-200. It was en route from Indianapolis, Indiana to Columbus, Ohio, and then to Washington. Once again, always unique, right, that before deregulation, these routes that were flown around the country. Uh, I know some people that work at the Indianapolis airport. They always win the J.D. Power and Associates. I, I jokingly ask who they're paying off each year, but uh, it is a really nice terminal that they have there. But what else do you really have to compare it to in Indiana? <laughs> I did work in South Bend, Indiana for a while, so I guess you have that and maybe what uh, Evansville, Terre Haute, I guess there's Gary. Uh, I think they're trying to get commercial service back. They hired a firm, Meet and Hunt, to look into attracting commercial service. So maybe Gary will be back on the list for Indiana as well. So a little bit into the actual event. On Sunday morning of Thanksgiving weekend, eastern half of the United States experienced severe weather, high winds, snow, and rain. The flight was scheduled for an arrival at Washington National Airport but was diverted to Dallas when high crosswinds east of 28 knots and gusting to 49 knots prevented safe operations on the main north and south runway at Washington National. The aircraft was flown by Captain Richard Brock, First Officer Leonard Kreshik, and Flight Engineer Thomas Suffernick. 
The flight was being vectored for a non-precision instrument approach to runway 12 at Dulles, a heading of east-southeast. Air traffic controllers clearing them down to 7,000 feet, but not on a published segment. So kind of flying by wire here at this point. So here's the scene. They were supposed to go into Reagan International Airport at this time called Washington National. It wasn't until the Clinton administration and Ronald Reagan's 87th birthday where they renamed the airport Ronald Reagan International Airport PATCO, which was Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization. Now, obviously, the new union is NACA, National Air Traffic Controller Association. Old controllers, uh, up until, I think most of them are probably now retired and gone, but they refused to vector aircraft to Reagan National Airport uh, because they were still upset over all the firings that happened in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan ordered all of them to go back to work. And the ones that didn't, he fired them. Uh, So there were still some hard feelings. Painting the scene, the aircraft's trying to get into national, can't get into national. It's being vectored back in a non-published, so kind of fly-by-wire, to Dulles Airport. And this is down to 7,000 feet. Bad weather, it's close to Thanksgiving. People are rushing. People want to get to where they want to be. The jetliner began to descend to 1,800 feet, shown on the first checkpoint of the published approach. The cockpit voice recorder later indicated there was some confusion in the cockpit over whether they were still under a radar-controlled approach segment, which would have allowed them to descend safely. After reaching 1,800 feet, there were some 1 to 200 foot altitude deviations, which the flight crew discussed as encountering heavy downdrifts and reduced visibility in snow. So now people are confused. They don't know what kind of approach they're on. The weather is bad, and they're getting a lot of up and downs with reduced visibility in the snow. So bad imaging with all around this flight deck. So now they're kind of flying blind, right? If you've ever been in an aircraft and like, you go over like an area like Lake Michigan and you lose that kind of reference at nighttime between the skyline, the, the, the water underneath you. It is a difficult situation. You know, now you're 11 a.m. in the morning, you're in snow, uh, you don't know what kind of approach you're on. Unfortunately, at 11 a.m., something appears in the not so far distance, mountain weather. At 11 a.m., the plane impacted the west slope at 1,670 feet above sea level at approximately 230 knots. The wreckage was contained within about 900 to 200 feet area. The evidence of first impact were trees sheared off about 70 feet above the ground. The elevation at the base of the trees was 1,650 feet. The wreckage path was oriented along a 118-degree magnetic direction. Calculations indicated that the left wing went down about 6 degrees as the aircraft passed through the trees, and the aircraft was descending at an angle of about 1 degree. After about 500 feet of travel through the trees, it struck a rock outcropping from the elevation at about 1,675 feet. Numerous heavy components of the aircraft were thrown forward of the outcropping and numerous intense post-impact fires broke out, which were later extinguished. So at this point, it's sounding a lot like the controlled flight we talked about with Eastern Airlines 401, which flew into the Everglades, if we remember that podcast. Ironically enough, also had some spooky twists to it as well, as we're in our spooky month. The Accident Investigation Board was split on the decision as whether the flight crew or air traffic control were responsible. The majority absolved the controllers as the plane was not on a published approach segment. The dissenting opinion was that the flight had been radar vectored. Terminology between pilots and controllers differed without either group being aware of the discrepancy. It was common practice at the time for controllers to release a flight to its own navigation with a cleared for approach. And flight crews commonly believed that it was also authorization to descend to the altitude at which the final segment of the approach began. No clear indication had been given by the controllers to Flight 514, and they were no longer on a radar vector segment, and therefore responsible for their own navigations. Procedures were clarified after this accident, and controllers now state maintain specified altitude until established on a portion of the approach. The pilots now understand that previously assigned altitudes prevail until altitude changes are authorized by the published approach segment, and aircraft is currently flying. Ground proximity detection equipment was also mandated to the airlines. During the NTSB investigation, it was discovered that a United Airlines flight had very narrowly escaped the same fate during the same approach and at the same location only six weeks prior. 
The discovery set into motion activities that led to the development of the Aviation Safety Reporting System by the FAA and NASA in 1976 to collect voluntary confidential reports of possibly safety hazards from aviation professionals. So it's interesting, the terrain alert, uh, I was actually training in California. Uh, so I used to go into an airport called South County, and I was in a Remos. I think I've talked about this in some podcasts. The Remos is an interesting aircraft. It's kind of like a bush plane without any of the ability of a bush plane. It comes apart within four hours, but the airframe, the tires, the, uh, the just the makeup of the aircraft, it wouldn't be very good for... Uh, soft field landings. Uh, so while you could take it apart quickly, uh, you really kind of need like a concrete surface or asphalt surface to take it off from. But what I remember landing in that aircraft, it had terrain avoidance in it. And every time you would come into the airport, you would get the alert of, you know, terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. And, uh, you know, it was it was interesting because you heard that blaring in the background <laughs> every time you were trying to do touch and goes. Um Supposedly the flight school had a way to turn it off, but it was it, it always just kind of defaulted to turning back on. So you kind of got to the point where you were living with it. But I can just imagine on like a common traffic advisory frequency talking to other aircraft or advising of your location and intentions. You're hearing all this going on in the background. Probably think we were going into a, a mountain somewhere. Uh, interesting to note this mountain designated to be used by the federal government in a nuclear war, but the crash did not damage any of the facility that's built into this mountainside. According to the National Transportation Safety Business Report, contributing factors were a failure of the FAA to make timely action to resolve the confusion and misinterpretation of air traffic terminology, although the agency had been aware of the problem for several years. The issuance of an approach clearance when the flight was 44 miles from the airport on an unpublished route without clearly defined minimum altitudes and inadequate depiction of altitude restrictions on the profile view of the approach part for a VOR DME approach to runway 12 at Dulles International Airport. So that was the, the controller side to it. If you read a little bit of the back and forth on the, what's going on in the flight deck between the crew, at 11.04, the flight reported it was level at 7,000 feet. Five seconds after receiving that report, the controller said, TWA Flight 514, you're cleared for VOR DME approach to runway 12. This clearance was acknowledged by the captain. The CVR recorded the sound of the landing gear warning horn, followed by a comment from the captain that 1800 is at the bottom. The first officer then said, start down. The flight engineer said, we're out here quite a ways. I better turn the heat down. At 11.05 and 6 seconds, the captain reviewed the field elevation, the minimum descent altitude, and the final approach fixed and discussed the reason that no time to the missed approach point was published. At 11.06 and 15 seconds, the first officer commented that, I hate that altitude jumping around. The captain said, we have a discrepancy in our VORs. A little, but not much, he continued. Fly yours, not mine. At 11.06 and 27 seconds, the captain discussed the last reported ceiling and minimum descent altitude. He concluded, should break out. At 11.06 and 42 seconds, the first officer said, gives you a headache after a while watching this jumping around like that. At 11.07 to 27 seconds, he said, you can feel the wind down here now. A few seconds later, the captain said, you know, according to this dumb sheet, it says 3,400 to round hill in our minimum altitude. The flight engineer then asked where the captain saw that, and the captain replied, well, here, Round Hill is 11 and a half DME. The first officer said, well, but the captain replied, when he clears you, that means you can go down to your... An unidentified voice now chimes in and says, you can go down to your initial approach. And another unidentified voice says, yeah. Then the captain said, initial approach altitude. The flight engineer then said, we're out of 28 for 18. And an unidentified voice said, right. And someone said, one to go. So at this point, right, the crew's going back and forth, looking at the distance measuring equipment, discussing the approach in, discussing the air traffic control towers. But at no point is anyone saying that they should remove themselves from the approach. You know, you have questioning that the flight engineer is, is you know, making comments about being so far out and the clearance that they received. But at no point at, up to this has anybody talked about even you know, removing themselves potentially from this approach. At 11.08 and 57 seconds, the altitude alert sounded. The first officer said, boy, it wanted to go right down through there, man. To which an unidentified voice replied, yeah, 
Then the first officer said, must have had a number of a downdraft. At 11.09 and 14 seconds, the radio altimeter warning horn sounded and stopped. The first officer said, boy. At 11.09 and 20 seconds, the captain said, get some power on. The radio altimeter warning sounded again and stopped. At 11.09 and 22 seconds, the sound of an impact was recorded. So over the course of five minutes, they went from questioning what they were doing to a controlled flight into terrain. A solemn note, at 11.09 and 54 seconds, the approach controller called Flight 514 and said, TWA Flight 514, say your altitude. There was no response to this or subsequent calls. Of course, the media was quick to report on the accident. Upsetting to the families, it was told over and over again on news reports that no one important was on the aircraft. Obviously, horrible terminology to use when anybody passes away. And there was an American Airlines flight that avoided this same issue just 30 minutes before this accident, showing the relevance of these procedural approaches into airports, like in this case, Dulles. Uh, Despite its enormous safety impact of... TWA Flight 514, it is largely forgotten today, overshadowed by the many other deadlier and more spectacular disasters that befell the industry in the 1970s. The subtleties of the approach procedures were never as captivating to the public as the drama of massive mechanical failures or scandalous design shortcuts. 46 years after the crash into Mount Weather, the force has regrown over the place where the wreckage of Flight 514 came to rest. The only sign of the tragedy that unfolded there is a pair of crosses and a small plaque on top of a rock outcropping besides the Blue Ridge Mountain Road, easily mistaken for the makeshift memorials of car crash victims that populate the margins of American highways. But while there are no sprawling memorial parks or big budget made for TV documentaries to commemorate the crash of TWA Flight 514, those who still grieve for the 92 victims can take solace in the fact that because of their unwanted sacrifice, untold masses have been saved from countless future accidents that never came to be. It's also interesting, we talked about uh, when this aircraft crashed, it actually revealed that there was this nuclear bunker built into the side of the mountain for VIPs for a, a nuclear holocaust. I guess it was unknown up to that time, so this flight accidentally revealed this location. But because this is October, we did want to talk about some of the spooky stuff that has been said about this flight. As we talked about, little known of the location now of this accident besides a cross on the side of the road. However, that hasn't stopped the rumors coming about of the 85 passengers and seven crew members that may have never left the mountainside. Deep in the woods, bordering Mount Weather, a group of seasoned hunters set out at the break of dawn. Their anticipation mingling with the crisp autumn air. Little did they know the force held secrets that would challenge their very fabric of their understanding. As they ventured deeper, the distant echo of a jet engine reverberated through the trees, an eerie sound that seemed out of place in the tranquil wilderness. The hunters exchanged puzzle glances, scanning the skies for the source of the phantom noise, yet no aircraft appeared overhead. Unease settled among the group as they grew through the forest with its noises becoming more pronounced. Suddenly, the distant hum of a jet engine ceased, leaving an ominous silence in its wake. The hunters, now on high alert, found themselves standing in a clearing, surrounded by towering trees that seemed to guard ancient secrets. It was then that they noticed him, a figure in a captain's uniform standing at the edge of the tree line. The air itself seemed to still as the man's stoic and spectral locked eyes with the bewildered hunters. His gaze held a weight of sorrow. The hunter, seasoned and unyielding, felt an explicable chill as the captain's figure remained silent. The forest, once a realm of familiar challenges, transformed into a theater of the uncanny. The man in the captain's uniform, a ghostly sentinel from the past, as quickly as the figure appeared, the sound of the jet engine returned, growing fainter with each passing moment. The captain dissolved into the shadows, leaving the hunters in a state of disbelief. The forest, now touched by the echoes of the aviation tragedy, whispered tales the pilot forever bound to the tree lines. The hunters emerged from the woods and returned to their lodge, that night going to a local pub where they ate and drank. They started to share the story when a local piped up and said, You know where you were hunting is where TWA Flight 514 crashed. Unbeknownst to the men, they were unaware that anything had happened. 
And this goes back to what we talked about, where individuals are not only unaware of this accident, but with the very minimal evidence of an impact site or memorial, it's easy to forget anything ever happened there. Well, my friends, that is the end of our spooky tale to flight 514. As we're getting towards the end of the month, we'll have one more episode before Halloween. Myself, I will be traveling for business this week. Uh, and then on vacation in Michigan. And so I may not get something out directly next weekend, but I do plan to get something out before trick-or-treating on Tuesday, because how could I not finish up this spooky season with all of you in a final episode, and then we can kind of get back to regularly scheduled programming. Thank you to those who I've had a chance to talk with out in Las Vegas. Uh, Thank you to those who are subscribing to the channel. If you haven't, you can just click the button and subscribe. Uh, It helps us out here, so we do appreciate it. Uh, We're getting a lot of views over in the Asian country, so I just wanted to say thank you there for our listeners. Um, That is now first or second largest to the U.S. And I laugh because Germany is up there as well, so maybe we will be David Hasselhoff to (laughs) the Germans. Uh, I guess for whatever reason, David Hasselhoff cannot walk the streets in Germany. I also have a lot of listeners in Saskatchewan, uh, so thank you for whoever is there tuning in. I see your views, so uh, just going through some of the data that we get in, and it's pretty neat to see people listening all over the globe. You know, get on the website, purchase a sticker if you like. Uh, remember to subscribe to our channel. It helps us out. And until next time, I will see you down the runway.